All right, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me over in, uh, over in Adelaide and around here um, and to be able to come and speak to you all tonight about uh, some of the insurance side of things, um, uh, particularly in the IT, IT insurance space. Um, my background, I'm the Professional Indemnity Manager at Ausbrokers Countrywide. So we're a broker of about 100 people down in Melbourne, um, take care of a large portfolio of, of IT and engineers and everything professional indemnity and, and IT. Um, so I got introduced through from Ben from Odd Games, who, who sort of connected me in, which is fantastic. Um, I'll go over a little bit of what an IT policy encompasses, um, a little bit over professional indemnity, public liability, cyber, which is becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, it is becoming almost a you know a must have um, for a lot of uh, a lot of contracts now. We're finding a lot of people are requesting it as standard. What's good versus what's bad, and a couple of claims examples that that we've got from um, from some of our insurers. Uh, IT policies are very very broad in what they will encompass. They will encompass traditional sort of you know service support through to services software through to app developers, game developers. Um, some project managers, we, we place them under, under an IT policy because a lot of what they do is, is parked online um, because of what their, their job title and their job function uh, will largely be based around IT exposures. Uh, cover your breach of professional duty, um, defamation, IP breaches, which is we've had an increasing number of issues coming out of apps games, developer, things like that, because it's not always something that's just included as standard under your insurance, or it is sublimited to a certain certain amount. Um, yeah, something to very, very keep in, in mind, um, because if you do get caught in that, we've had a number of issues that have blown up, uh, size, turned into sizable claims. Um, public liability, far less of, a, of an issue. Um, especially for you know white collar consultants, IT consultants, things like that. The reason they tend to put them both together in an IT setting, uh, IT liability setting, is because there's a bit of a grey area between what is your service and what is the the product that you've developed, being the the game, the app, um, the the platform, um, you know, whatever that that may be. Um, the actual slip strips falls much less of a problem unless you know you drop a laptop trip over a cord leave a bag on the ground it's fairly fairly skinny risk your professional indemnity and public liability it ties to a couple of insuring clauses um, so yeah breach of professional duty um, uh, be a financial loss to a third party um, so if you're engaged to to do some development work or to, if you're creating an, an, an app um, and you uh, are engaged by a third party and you would say it will do A, B and C and third party goes, well, no, it doesn't do, it does half of A, a little bit of B and Y, they can, they can bring a claim against you. Now, unfortunately, litigation in Australia is not that flash. Um, even to make something to go away can cost Twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars in legal fees, um, plus whatever indemnities that they try and pull out of you as well, which is why you take out the insurance because uh, the insurers' lawyers are, are there to help, basically. Uh, public liability, much the same. Uh, there has to be something that you're legally obliged to pay, so something that you did directly that caused the caused the loss. Cyber, much more interesting and much more sort of topical, uh, especially at the moment. Um, it covers things like incident response. So if you turn, you know, walk in, turn your computer on or open your laptop and there's you know, something on your computer, a crypto locker or something you know, to that effect. Uh, the insurers have got specific companies uh, that they engage that most of them function off an app. So you open up the app, hit the button and somebody will call you immediately to help mitigate or, or um, deal with it with the issue um, some of the time it is as flat as just pay the ransom and move on or they will assist in in trying to to dismantle it or try and um, uh, uh, bring the system back 
uh, whether that's through a back door or, or um, uh, if they know the know what kind of virus it is, they'll know how to how to fix it. Um, your cyber extortion, as I touched on, crypto lockers and things like that. Um, there has been instances where the uh, individual has just tried to pay it, or the company's just tried to pay it and make it go away. Uh, unfortunately, these things, as I'm sure you've heard, tend to not just disappear. They like to stick around and try and have another go, and so they'll just keep coming back and keep coming back. And yeah, it's something that the insurers are, are there to, to help out with. System damage. System damage is, uh, it can just be them coming in and just trashing your system, uh, nicking all your, your IP, nicking all, all of your data, um, all your contacts, uh, everything like that. Or it can be something as simple as um, physical damage to your, your systems. So dropping a laptop, server breaks, somebody smashes it, somebody, you know, someone breaks in here and decides to smash all the screens and smash all the servers and things like that. They'll actually cover the, the, the rectification of data. Um, your system business interruption. So if you're, you know, you're chugging along, running your business, you're, you get locked out of your system or your system gets trashed because of a, a cyber event. The income that you would have earned in the absence of that event is an insurable section. That is the most claimed section of, of any of the sections that I've covered. So professional indemnity, public liability or cyber, your business interruption under, under the cyber is the, the biggest area of loss. Um, followed closely by cyber crime. So social engineering claims are just rampant. Um, I was just saying that it's been become far more frequent going through COVID as people are working from home. Uh, they don't necessarily have the same same uh, level of security on their computer. You know, they flick on the old Windows 95 and it's not quite the same uh, same firewalls and same systems as what they'll have in an office. Um, you know, Jan from Accounts thinks that the boss has sent me a, a uh, Apple iPhone card and clicks the link and Next thing you know, everything's gone. Uh, yeah, it's become a lot more frequent. Um, as such, the, the, the rates have increased. Uh, insurers have contracted on what they um, will and won't do, um, the amount of information that they want to know. Uh, they, they wanna know. Regulatory fines. Uh, if you hold a lot of customer data um, and your system gets breached, there are mandatory reporting laws in Australia it's the, the fines are $140 per customer, or per, per individual, per piece of identifiable data. So it doesn't sound much, but when it's personally identifiable data, it can extrapolate to three or four bits per individual, which means that $140 can turn into tens of thousands of dollars. And there are mandatory notification of, uh, to the customer as well. And that can't just be an email, can't just be a text message, it's got to be registered mail, which is a bizarre concept that you have to send something with a stamp on it, but whatever. Um, yeah, that, that cost can get up there pretty quick as well. It's more so, happy, there's actually been no issues in Australia. Obviously our friends over in the US have been absolutely battered with this. Um, if you're, you know, the, the PlayStation issue, the Sony issue that happened a couple of years ago, if that happened now, every single person who has an account with Sony would have to have that, have to receive that, that letter. What's the time frame on that? How long do you have to report it? Uh, you've got, I think they give you three months grace and then it must be, must be notified. Yep. Uh, good versus bad. Uh, look, I contacted a couple of underwriters to sort of get their feedback on what they wanted to see from customers and what they don't like to see. Almost all of it came back that they want to, they want to see transparency. They want to know everything, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, uh, they want to see that you've actually got contracts of engagement. And even if it's not even that in-depth, um, uh, a, a scope of works. So set out what you're engaged to do and what you're, in, you're not going to do. So it's black and white. In the event of any issue blowing up or anything um, getting out of control, you've got quite clearly, even if it is very, very basic one pager, I am here to do X, Y, 
to deliver Z in X time frame. Um, if it's all just quite fluid and it's all done by a handshake or an elbow bump, depending on what state you're in, um, that's when things can get uh, out of control and you can get dragged. And it's very unfortunate that you can get dragged into these things. Um, unfortunately, litigation is just, it's a beast unto itself and nobody wins but the lawyers. But you, yeah, you, you definitely can get dragged into these things. Um, like I've touched on, good description of business activities. Um, undesirables, lack of contractual management. Um, so as, as things grow bigger, not just signing anything that's thrown in front of you, engaging lawyers, insurance brokers, insurers to, to review those terms of you know um, terms and conditions. Uh, not just for risk side of things, but to protect yourself as well. If you pour hours and hours into building something or developing something, and then in the fine print of the contract, you find out that they actually own everything that you have developed, which is not ideal because they can just can you and take all your hard work and, and go and develop something else. Uh, so that's, there's, a, there's a couple of sort of layers in, in making sure that those contracts are, are reviewed. Um, casino games, gaming development, um, gambling. It, there's, there's almost a little bit of an echelon. It, it sounds very bizarre, but there's a, 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 um, an ethical dilemma that a lot of insurers have uh, around covering those sort of platforms um, because there are, there's obviously the addictive um, uh, exposures there as well which ethical and insurers sometimes it's a little it sounds bizarre but they, they do exist um, there's also the issues around uh, the payment platforms so if there's in-game purchases or um, in in app purchases uh, insurers need to know about that now if that function is, is taken care of entirely by a third party then that's no problem. Insurers love that because of third party. All the risk sits, sits with the third party. But if you built it in as, as part of your app or game or, or uh, program, then that adds another another layer because that can get pinched or copied or or um, compromised and can leave your customer out of out of pocket. Uh, claims examples. These are always you know the interesting bits. Um, now I got told off by a colleague because I just put too much data in a PowerPoint, but I'm not, I, I have an assistant who builds all my PowerPoints and she told me off, so I'm sorry. Um, I can email this round if that helps and we can all zoom in together. Um, uh, social engineering. So this is the, imperson <coughs> excuse me, impersonating a third party uh, to gain financial uh, advantage. Uh, a financial controller re received uh, in a law firm, received a call from someone purporting to be from the firm's bank, explaining that some s suspicious transfers have been flagged. In short, they asked, they convinced her to give them the, the account details, the PIN number, and how long onto the account. The total loss was $118,000. This can take weeks to find out that this had even happened. And not only that, the, the bank was under no obligation to return the funds because it was done legally. They had logged onto the account, they'd used the PIN number, they'd used all the account details and transferred the money over a, over a number of transactions. So if, it, you know, if you're hacked, hacked, then the banks are generally pretty good at being able to peg back some of, some of the funds. But because this was done legally, it was done above the board uh, and in normal process, the banks didn't give anything back. Now, uh, insurers, there's a handful of insurers who, who have uh, cover for this up to sort of two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. So it, it, they'll indemnify that, but there's not many people, not many companies who can take a hundred grand hit and keep, keep going. Um, data breach. Um, so actually nicking, nicking data, nicking client data, nicking customer data. <coughs> a healthcare clinic was the victim of a cyber attack where patient information had been stolen. Hackers were threatening to post the data and public website unless they received a ransom pay a payment of 13,000 in Bitcoin. 
they called their, their uh, insurer, went through the process of mitigation, uh, went through the process of, of um, uh, lodging the claim and, and running it through. Uh, the insurers obviously helped them around the, the crypto locker as well as the, the, the data breach. Um, it wasn't a big claim, it washed out to be about 20 grand um, in getting the, the claim mitigation and, and running through, but then they also had uh, mandatory notification obligations, which can hurt the brand. You know, if my local doctor, you know, Melbourne GPs down the road have been hacked and all my information's been compromised, I'm not going to go down there. I'm going to go to you know, Adelaide doctors, GPs, because hopefully my data's safe. Uh, it can create that reputational damage, which that can just snowball and put, put somebody out of business um, pretty quick. Uh, flat business interruption. Uh, this is where we hear most of the claims come from. Um, in fact, it, it's, it's almost disproportionate. It's like 80% of the claims come from business interruption. Um, and we hear, hear a lot from, from customers going, oh, I'm not, not in that space. It's not a, not a problem. This was a food truck company um, who suffered a ransomware attack where the, the cyber criminals encrypted all of their data for all of their point of sale systems and told them, unless you pay, we're not going give to every, give everything back. The customer told them to get stuffed. I'm not paying. I can keep functioning without my point of sale systems. My, my staff can operate with a spreadsheet and a pencil. They would normally run, they would normally complete 220,000 sales transaction uh, in a month, but it was reduced to around 140,000. The total claim, total loss, so what they would have earned in the absence of that matter occurring they lost about a million dollars, which that's a, a lot of money. Now, had they just notified the insurer straight off the, straight off the bat, they may have been up and running in two or three days um, to get, get all, that, all that up and running. So situations like that, they can seem fairly benign or something that you just wanna you know, get, get rid of, um, but they can add up uh, very, very quickly. So that's sort of a, a little bit of an overview about IT uh, insurance and professional indemnity um, and cyber. Um, a few claims examples. So if there's any sort of questions that have come out of that? Yep. I had a question come up. Um, how do people manage to attack strong businesses? It was back when you were talking about the cyber liability. Like yep. how can we protect ourselves from them and how do they target big businesses? Because bus businesses are really well defended, yep. so how they manage to breach their system. So what they'll do is they'll spray out emails to, to everyone, all the, anyone from the admin to the, to the CEO to the CFO, everyone. And so what the hope is, is that once you click the link, once you've given them access in, all well, the system thinks that, they're, thinks that they're allowed in. So once they're in, that's it. Um, I was aware of a very large um, mining business in Victoria uh, that they... They were aware that there was a phishing email going through the company, that they thought they had it under control. They sort of drilled down to where the issue was and where it was trying to get in and shut the pipe. Eight months later, they did an audit of the number of admin logins that were on the system and noticed that there was one more, one extra admin login. So they'd got in, created an admin login, and all they did was monitoring any emails that had IPO, listing, acquisition, so basically, they were using it to, to inside a trade. But from the surface, these big businesses, who they were, they were a global business, thought they had it all under control, we're on it, we don't need it. Um, so they, they try and target everyone and make it look like a benign email. You might get an, a, an email from um, you know, gamesplus.admin. You know, it might have a dot one or something in there. At the surface, it'll look like a legitimate email. Um, but you know, going through, your, look, I'm sure that you all probably know a lot more about this than me. Um, if you hover over the email address, it'll actually show what the email address truly is. So making sure that you know, if it if it looks like a duck and cracks like a duck. So you can also inspect the source to find out who it's from. That yes. It's like a safe way of inspecting what the email content is as well. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Yep. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. 
Sorry? Isn't that the example you gave where the company lost a million dollars because they um, tried to their own way. Did they end up getting paid? Yeah, so they, the, the policy responds because they it'll, it'll respond to the full limit. So whether it's a million dollars or two million or, or whatever the policy limit is that you purchase, they it, it will respond because that's what the intent of the, the policy is to return you back to your, to your spot. But once you've taken a million dollar hit, even though the insurer will pay it, you've got to be able to carry it on. Plus your customers are a bit dirty because they didn't get their, you know, their burger and fries in the same amount of time. Like, it's just this knock-on effect that, that can cause all, all the problems. What was the company's position on the decision they took whether or not to pay the blackmail? They're kind of a, I just don't think yeah, no, look, we don't, don't have that kind of yeah, line of sight, but he, he was, in, in the example, he was a gentleman who had just told him to get stuffed and I don't want to pay it, which is understandable. So like with smaller groups of like maybe indie developers who might, might not have released a game yet, but they might be working together to reduce the title in the future. Um, mm. Is this sort of insurance something that they might not really need until they're kind of getting close to that sort of release window? Or is it something that would be beneficial sort of throughout the process to like cover like your own PC, your online file? Basically? Yes, yeah, stuff like that. So even even just to cover your, you know, if you're, if you're running and even, even unbeknownst to you, you sort of borrow some IP, um, and somebody chooses to take you to task, that's the kind of thing that'll... that'll so they have a way to yeah. like, say you've put six months into a project with a bunch of people and you've suddenly lost all that work. Like, I'm guessing it's kind of hard to determine an actual sort of monetary value. Is that something that you see? Kind of yeah, so if, it, if, it, if the loss arises as a, as a result of a cyber attack, so if your system gets compromised, <coughs> excuse me, uh, your system gets compromised, you lose six months worth of work. The policy will will pay to to recreate that data. So whether it's your your time spending six months rebuilding it, whether it's um, their their forensic IT guys trying to rebuild it, whatever the case may be, it, that's what that's what it's intended to be. So um, uh, there was a large architecture firm who architects are a funny piece that they'll. They'll design, so they'll have a design for a four-bedroom house, a three-bedroom house, and a two-story two townhouse. And that's the nuts and bolts of it, and they'll sort of rebuild. You know, they'll use it, but they'll modify it. They've been using the same set of plans for 10 years. Then they had a, an event. They lost everything. So they had to rebuild all these templated um, things, which took yeah, ages and ages to build. But, yeah, that's the, that's the kind of thing. All, all, yeah, far away. Yeah, so two things. One, uh, definitely that's the, the kind of thing that, that the policy will cover if, they, if it does get dragged into a grey area. And again, even if, it, if, it, if something comes up in the, in the insured's position, so in your position, you handball it to us and let the lawyers go and discuss it. Um, secondly, you having to indemnify a third party, probably not something we would uh, encourage um, just because it, it, it takes your exposure from here to sort of here, um, which can, yeah. So that was, um, there was a contract template that comes from the um, Arts Law organisation. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, it's like, well, I think that obviously you would expect that um, a game developer would want to be indemnified yes. by a composer if they're providing original music for them. So I would assume that. Yeah, so what, what, we, what we encourage people to do is um, there's additional wording that can be put uh, to go along with those indemnity clauses, things like um, you know, we'll indemnify you to the, to the extent that we're liable or to the extent that we're at fault. So then it, it sort of pulls it back to, well, we're only going to be indemnif uh, we're only gonna indemnify you for the bit that I'm doing. We've seen contracts where we'll indemnify you for anything arising on, around or from the site. Well, Nana could be walking down the road and trip on a coat bottle or break her hip. Well, I'm not going to pay for that. Like, I had nothing to do with Nana walking down the road. Or the coat bottle, for that matter. Anything <laughs> yeah. yeah. else? Uh, yeah, far away. No, it can do, definitely. Definitely. Because, it, it, you know, insurers look at it um, fairly, you know, laterally. They look in the amount they brought in versus the amount they paid out. Um, IT professionals has run amazingly. Their, their premiums have stayed 
dirt, dirt cheap. Um, you know, startup, startup um, IT professionals are paying six to eight hundred dollars startup. Um, even if you do have sizable claims, because of the number, sheer volume, and the, the number of, of individuals who take the policies, the premiums are, are, are you know, there's a fairly big premium pool. So to blow that out, where they take a bit. We, we, we've had clients who've had a couple of hundred thousand dollar claims on a, say, a five grand premium, and the premium may have moved 20, 30 percent. Yeah, so not, not massively. Yeah. I, I want to know if my perspective's right on this, but earlier you said something about the contracts needing review. Now, I'll put myself in a couple of different scenarios. One is I'm an employee and I've got the insurance, even though I'm probably also a contractor, and I'm wanting to get a job somewhere and I'm not sure about this contract with the business that I could potentially take it to you guys and have it looked over? Yeah, so we'll, we'll yeah, we have a look at, um, oh, as an employee, you're covered by your employer. So as a PAYG, your, your employer covers everything. Yeah, you know, you're, you're fine. Um, we're, we're, you're, we're you're a subcontractor. Um, we, we review a lot of sub, um, uh, subcontractor contracts yep. um, from an insurance perspective. So we look at what your exposures are Versus, you know, and then it's like uh, if you have, if you're one employee and there's another employee and they want to work together on a project where it's just a company working with toys and then someone's like a game developer, you'd look at the contract between the two companies, whoever's writing it. Yeah, that's correct. If it's two separate two separate entities that are coming together, then yeah, we can, we can look at the the, the JV uh, contract or or whatever the, whatever the vehicle's been built to to enter into that that project. Yeah. All right, no worries. Thank you very much for that. And look, if you have any questions, yell out and we'll have a chat. All right, thanks very much.